Just to introduce myself, my name is Anne Watt. I'm the director of Pivotal, the public policy think tank for Northern Ireland. And we work in partnership with Professor Maurice McCarthy from Queen's University to be the Northern Ireland IPO team. So I'm delighted that we have some accents from across the sea in this session. Um, and, in, and in fact, across many seas when we get onto to one of the speakers. So um, welcome to this. Um, really pleased you can join us. Um, what we're going to do is hear from three experts on population, mental health and COVID. So they're going to give brief presentations and then we hope that most of the session will be interactive with questions and answers from you and comments from you. So please do you do use the chat function and also if you want to um, ask a question, just put up your hand or give me a wave and I'd be very, very happy to allow you to ask, ask a question to the speakers. So we'll kick off with um, uh, short presentations from the three speakers and then move on to Q&A and we'll finish up about 12.25. So the three speakers I've got today are Professor Siobhan O'Neill from Ulster University, who is the mental health champion for Northern Ireland, Dr. Karen Wetherill from the Institute of Health and Wellbeing at the University of Glasgow, and Eleanor Williams, who's from across many bits of sea and land um, from the government of Victoria in Australia. So thank you particularly to Eleanor, who's um, I think probably should be in bed by now, but has stayed up late to be, to be part of the session. So we really appreciate, appreciate that, Eleanor. So we're all aware of the impacts of COVID on mental health, long periods of isolation, of not having our normal work and social and family contacts. We've all experienced that personally. We may have seen the impacts of that on uh, our own mental health, the mental health of those around us, and certainly many of you will have seen it in a professional context as well. Um, the impacts of COVID on mental health are one of the issues that IPO has prioritised, as Jeff Mulgan was just saying, um, and uh, IPO has been looking at what is the evidence for the impacts on mental health of COVID, but also what do we think then the policy response should be. Um, and there's a, a systematic review of that going on by IPO at the minute. So it's really good to have this session today. There are three key questions for this session. So first of all, about the evidence. What is the evidence of how COVID has impacted on population mental health? Then secondly, what do we think the policy response should be to that? Um, and then thirdly, are, are we aware of any positive legacy outcomes so far in terms of the policy response that's happened? So I'm going to invite Siobhan, please, to speak to us as our first contributor. Um, while Siobhan is sharing her slides, so I'll, I'll ask you to do that now, Siobhan, if you can. Um, I'll just do a few words of introduction. So Siobhan is, Professor Siobhan O'Neill is the mental health champion for Northern Ireland. She's a professor of mental health sciences at Ulster University and as mental health champion here, she advises and, and assists in the promotion of mental health and well-being through all policies and services in Northern Ireland. So thank you, Siobhan, very much for joining us and I'll hand over to you. Siobhan, you're on mute, just unmute yourself. I couldn't come off mute until I stopped sharing my screen. Sorry about that. We get back to business. So hopefully you can hear me now. It's a pleasure to be here. And I was appointed on an interim basis in August uh, 2020. So right bang in the middle of this pandemic. Um, this had been this, this idea of a mental health champion had been in our new decade, new approach deal, which got our government back in action. Um, and the and the idea was to just to get this cross-departmental approach to mental health and well-being, recognizing that it was not just about tackling mental illness and creating a, a mental health strategy for, for a mental health service. Um, but, but I came to this in the middle of the pandemic and very quickly started um, speaking publicly about the impact of the pandemic on, on mental health and the restrictions and getting involved in that debate. And of course, it's still haunting me, <laughs> all of that stuff and social media um, at the minute this morning too. So, um, but I was involved in then the various government committees um, from August 2020 onwards. 
Um, so what was the impact of the pandemic and well-being in Northern Ireland? I'm showing our Northern Ireland Health Survey data, which I think is particularly interesting um, as a general you know, marker of where our population was um, at, the, at, the, at the height of the pandemic. Life satisfaction and happiness uh, did go down. Um, because we were enduring a collective stressor, um, anxiety and loneliness went up. Um, and of course, we saw the trends that other regions and other countries had where women, people who lived alone, young people had poor well-being. And in all of our studies, you, those young people um, had, had worse well-being and mental health symptoms, not necessarily mental illness, which is an important point that I keep trying to make. Um, females more likely to be lonely than males. Um, and we know loneliness is associated with a range of um, adverse outcomes, um, not just in terms of mental health, but, but in physical health and, and also. Um, so females more likely to feel lonely than males. That 16 to 4, 24 year age group were more likely to feel lonely as well. And that was like a quarter compared to the Northern Ireland average of nearly one in five. Um, the deprivation gradient was apparent in Northern Ireland um, with the most deprived areas, people who, who lived there feeling very lonely. So 25% compared to 13.5%. Um, levels of self-efficacy, interestingly, and internal locus of control ha have increased. So at a time when we were experiencing um, uh, severe restrictions, significant restrictions to our daily lives, um, the, the data that was coming in from this health survey, um, and this has been tracked over time, showed that self-efficacy was higher than ever before um, and internal locus of control. Slight, slightly different things there, belief that we have internally um, power over our outcomes and then self-efficacy is control over, over what we do and what happens to ourselves our bodies so this is really interesting and I think this is something we need to have a bigger conversation about how do we maintain that what was that about what has that shift been and how can we mobilize that now going forward to the betterment of everybody another um important study was the young people in lockdown study that the Princess Trust um, did. Again, we know about the mental health symptoms but but I am concerned about the scarring effect on hope in young people. Um, so daily feelings of panic and anxiety a third there, but nearly half said that they felt finding a job was now impossible. So that is really worrying. Um, and that's, you know, our COVID recovery plan includes this sort of stuff, but I'm concerned that it might not be implemented and I'm going on to the next slide. But it's so important that we create hope for young people. Powerlessness a young, among young people. Um, so overall, internal locus of control is improved, self-efficacy is improved. Young people aren't getting that. And that anxiety um, and panic um, was there now. We need to check if that's gone away, but Princess Trust doing great work there. Um, so what has what our policy response been? There's been a, a mental health fund to fund the voluntary and community sector organizations to provide those interventions at, at community level, early intervention. Now there's some counseling and therapeutic interventions have been funded as well, and there'd be more money put into mental health services, but that idea of a uni universal intervention to get people back out again, to target those groups that have been worst affected, that, that's what we've tried to do with our mental health fund. It was massively oversubscribed. But there's some great work going on there. Education Restart, again, they did get that message um, about the importance of emotional regulation and lots of guidance provided to schools. But when we talked to the young people, they were still concerned about their exams. And that's a point I'm making. We need to change the system here as well, because the pressure that they're feeling is, you know, it is about exams. It's about inequality. It's about a scarcity mindset. It's about um, not being good enough. We did do some summer programs in schools and the Department of Education funded those for the first time ever. £5,000 was available to schools to run programs and I went out to see some of them and they were great and they were happening in deprived areas uh, with young people who would not have otherwise had those types of programs or those experiences. So I, th I think that was a really powerful intervention. A lot of schools, they, they felt they couldn't put this on their staff. They couldn't ask staff to come in. They just weren't able to do it for all sorts of reasons or felt they couldn't do it um, or that the money that was provided wasn't enough. Um, and then we had the COVID Wellbeing NI uh, website and lots of helplines and resources and stuff available there for all sorts of problems that people were feeling. And that, you know, that was important and was well used. I was doing campaigns to direct people into that website. And then I had a, an exercise physical activity campaign in January this year. So I'm going to stop there and happy to take questions about any of that stuff. Thank you.
That's brilliant, Siobhan. Thanks so much. And thanks for keeping to the time. And um, we're going to move on and ask um, Karen to share her slides. Um, that's brilliant, Siobhan. Thank you. So Karen, Dr. Karen Weatherall from the Institute of Health and Wellbeing at the University of Glasgow. So Karen's our research associate in the Suicidal Behaviour Research Lab in Glasgow. And she's currently involved with a number of projects, including the UK and Scottish COVID-19 mental health tracker studies. So Karen, I'm glad that during that introduction, the slides have been shared. So um, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank Great. you very much. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, as Anne said, I'm based at the Institute of Health and Wellbeing um, at the University of Glasgow. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you a wee bit about uh, a tracker study that we did uh, during the pandemic. Um, so eight waves of data that was really just the very, very start um, until uh, summer 2021. Oh, sorry, I can't get it to go to the next page there. <laughs> uh, so just a wee bit of context, obviously, at the start of the pandemic, there was a call uh, for, for research priorities. Um, and one of those was to track and monitor the, the mental health and well-being um, of, of people um, around the world. So rates of anxiety, depression, suicide were obviously key um, outcomes there that, that we were, were interested in. Um, so I was part of a group of researchers that came together at that point um, from across the UK, different universities, but also um, Samaritans, Scottish Association for Me Mental Health as well, um, were involved within the design of, of the research as well. Um, so we overview of um, the study and um, we got around 3000 people uh, to take part and um, obviously it was all co conducted online um, and that was representative of the UK population um, and we asked a whole range of mental health and, and a whole range of, of questions because obviously it was such a novel time um, we, we created lots and lots of questions uh, to tap different aspects of what people were doing during the, the lockdowns and the pandemic and how they were feeling. But I think importantly, we looked at depression, anxiety and suicidal thoughts and then other correlates of mental health, uh, such as loneliness and uh, defeat, feelings of defeat and entrapment. Um, so just to give you a kind of overview of the different waves and where they, I suppose, uh, fitted in with what was happening in the UK at that point in time. So the first three waves were really in, in quite close concession at the very start of the pandemic during that first lockdown. Um, so up from the end of March to roughly the start of May 2020. Um, and then wave four and then on to wave five were kind of late spring and then into the summer of 2020 when those restrictions and lockdown had, had eased. Um, and then on to wave six, that was the autumn of 2020 um, when COVID uh, cases were starting to increase again and the, the restrictions around the UK um, were increasing. And then unfortunately by wave seven, those uh, COVID cases had peaked again and we were back into a lockdown after Christmas um, of that year. Um, so that was in February, 2021. Um, and then in wave eight, again, it was the summer of 2021 when the restrictions had eased. I think in England, they, they'd pretty much been completely removed. Um, and importantly as well, the vaccine programme had rolled out by that point. So I think that that changed a lot of people's uh, perception of the pandemic and, and, and the, um, I suppose, created a bit more hope uh, going forward. So how did those restrictions, I suppose, kind of then uh, impact upon the mental health and, and were in the tracker study, did, did we find the kind of peaks and troughs of, of people's uh, mental health for, the, for that sample? Um, so with suicide or sorry, with depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms, now we don't have pre-pandemic data, so we can't say for absolute certainty that they were um, elevated from before. But certainly they were the highest for, throughout the whole uh, of the, the waves that we collected. Uh, the, there were the highest rates of depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms that we found. Um, 
So, and then they did steadily decrease. Um, so by wave three and wave four, there was a significant decrease in both depressive and anxiety symptoms. Um, so that's when obviously restrictions have began to ease. Um, but also I think people have probably adjusted a wee bit more to what was happening. It was just the start of such an anxiety inducing time. Um, and people had, you know, with the uncertainty of it all, um, is obviously going to be a factor there. Um, so we did find uh, that by wave five, obviously in the summer, those rates of depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms were, were, were lower. Um, there was a steady increase, particularly in depressive symptoms. So um, by wave seven, when we we're back into lockdown, uh, depressive symptoms were significantly higher. So almost 25% of the sample uh, reported moderate to severe depressive symptoms at that point. Um, and then reassuringly, whenever it came to the summer, whenever, like we said, the vaccine program was rolled out um, and the restrictions had eased, we did find those symptoms came down again. Now, interestingly, suicidal thoughts actually took a slightly different trajectory, where at the start, is when we found the lowest rates, and that actually increased. So by wave three, and wave four, approximately 10% of the sample reported suicidal thoughts. And then that kind of seemed to stabilize over the over the waves. Um, so roughly around 10 to 11 percent of the sample reported suicidal thoughts at, at most waves. Um, and so it never went back down. It, you know, it didn't increase dramatically again, but, but it never quite went back down to those um, early levels. So the, the kind of 8 percent that was reported at the start. Um, and then similarly to depressive symptoms, we found a similar trajectory where during periods of heightened uh, COVID numbers and heightened restrictions, uh, the factors such as loneliness and defeat and entrapment were high. Um, and then they tended to improve whenever restrictions were eased and, and the, the case numbers were, were coming down. And like we say, the vaccine program had obviously been rolled out. So really, it's it's unclear, I think, at this stage, what the longer term impact those fluctuations in mental health could have for people. Um, you know, we just we just don't quite know. But there, there's been no immediate increase in suicide rates um, evidenced as of yet. Um, and there's certainly been a few studies that have come out um, that have actually shown that most people have, have remained kind of resilient throughout. So that just means most people have maybe reported on the lower end of depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms um, throughout out the pandemic. Um, and, and then there's obviously groups that have reported higher, but the majority of people have remained relatively resilient. Um, but there is clear evidence that, that particular groups are consistently reporting poor mental health. And this is something that, that obviously just uh, Siobhan just touched on there. Uh, young people in particular, we, uh, we have seven, we found during the last lockdown, uh, we found that about 20% of, of young people were reporting suicidal thoughts, um, which I thought was quite a stark uh, figure, you know, compared to 10% of the general population. Uh, women compared to men consistently reported poor mental health. Uh, the lower socioeconomic grouping, um, you know, from people from deprived areas were reporting uh, worse mental health. And, and obviously those with a pre-existing mental health condition um, were most at risk as well. So, and then I'll just quickly go through a few wee recommendations. Um, this was actually drawn from recommendations we'd given to the Scottish government. We'd actually done a similar study um, with them and, and you can access the, the WEA5 report uh, on their website. Um, so we do recommend obviously timely access to mental health care, making sure those community and um, NHS services are supported as best as possible um, and, and that, that everyone can, can access those. Um, policy to alleviate financial hardship. I mean, that's even more pertinent at the minute with the cost of living um, increasing so much. Um, Ensuring that services are supported to provide trauma-informed care um, as best as possible. Um, young people should be prioritised when it comes to education, 
uh, on employment opportunities. Um, targeting those other at-risk subgroups, um, obviously women, um, so maternal care, um, you know, debt management and, and targeting kind of social isolation as well. Um, the importance of health and social care, you know, making sure those services are secure um, and supporting the people that provide those uh, you know, make, making sure that their well-being is, is looked after as well, the people that, that are, are at the front line. Uh, public health messaging, you know, we felt that it was really important to, in one way, be providing these positive messages, uh, positive coping uh, skills and, and promoting positive mental health. And then at the same time, making sure that we don't sensationalise, um, you know, suicide, any perceived increase in suicide rates or, or even just mental health uh, more generally. And continued vigilance, especially for those at risk um, subgroups that have been highlighted by not just our research, but, but so many different um, studies. Um, so continuing to monitor their, their mental health and well-being um, was uh, deemed important as well. Um, so yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, obviously, just let me know. Thank you. That's brilliant, Karen. Thanks very much. And, and really interesting to see the, just the, the tracking of the data in that study and the findings from that, and also to see some similarities coming out there between what Siobhan talked about in terms of differential impacts and what you find in, in that study as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Eleanor Williams. So Eleanor, can you share your slides, please, just while I introduce you? So Eleanor is Executive Director in the Department of Health for the Government of Victoria in Australia. So I think it's um, either 11 or nearly midnight in Australia at the minute. So thank you, Eleanor, for staying up late for us. Um, Eleanor is a public policy re research and evaluation professional with over 15 years experience working in the public sector. So she's currently executive director of mental health policy and strategy at the Victorian Department of Health. So Eleanor, thank you for joining us and over, over to you. Thank you, Anne. And yeah, it's, it's only it's almost 11 p.m. here, but so not too late. Um, and one thing I feel I should mention too, for a lot of the pandemic, I was actually the executive director of COVID-19 policy. So I got to sit on both sides of the fence in um, both having to think about the restrictions, their potential impact on mental health, and then um, jumping over to the other side to think about how we might address the issues that have come up. Now let's see if I can get these slides to change now. That's my next job. So I really just wanted to cover on three things and there is quite a lot of similarity across the presentation. So the first one is just about the increased prevalence of mental health issues. It's really stark and there are some arguments to say they're likely to be sustained over time. The second is to say we've seen some pretty big new investment from governments internationally, but we tend to be investing in the same kinds of things. So there's lots of new money, but it's going to traditional things. And then thirdly, that we've got a big opportunity here to get more innovative about how we think about how, how we support positive mental health and wellbeing beyond those traditional kind of measures, which are these sort of one-to-one -one, um, treatments that we tend to sort of go towards when we think of mental health supports um, in the community. So I did just want to do some, some quick stats. And this, I just found it quite interesting. It's very consistent with what we've heard from the other speakers. But what we saw sort of between 2019 and 2020 was like almost a doubling of um, anxiety symptoms. And you'll see UK is much more anxious than Australia. And I'm not sure why this is. I think it's probably a measurement thing as much as anything. Because then if you look at our depression rates, um, Australia is apparently much more depressed than people in the UK. So I think it'll be some kind of calibration issue. But the, the main thing I wanted to point to is we're talking, you know, it's almost a tripling of depressive simple symptoms in Australia and doubling in the UK. So there's a really big, big jumps that we're seeing. Um, you know, this is, this is not a small, this is a, this is a big and, and reasonably sustained change. Um, the other one I'll point to, which actually ties together a few points that for people with existing uh, mental health disorders, for women, for young people, eating disorders is actually sort of right at the nexus of all those things. And we've seen a really steady spike in eating disorders. It's been pretty sustained, but it is people who had existing experiences of eating disorders in the main part. I only use this graph, this is actually from America, but we've seen similar things. It was just the best, most kind of spiky graph I should show about how terrifying is the big increase in eating disorders. Um, but it is holding on in Victoria and I understand that the rates are pretty similar in the UK as well. 
a similar point to what Karen was making is in general that population distress is tracked with the intensity of kind of COVID-19 deaths and then the measures that go along with it to limit transmission. So it's a little bit hard to see on this graph, but the trajectory is really similar. So this top line is those depression anxiety indexes and the bottom line is the excess deaths and they're very, very similar patterns. So you do find the population tends to go go along with what's happening, like what they can see and what they're, what they're experiencing in their communities. I just want to make the point too. So governments internationally have shown this sort of trend that we tend to invest in two things. So one is the safeguarding the access to the mental health services. So doing all those things you need to do around managing service disruptions, around staffing and shifting to the online delivery when required um, and introducing new digital tools to support existing modes and new investments, but they tend to be in existing service models. So it's new money for public hospital services, for specialist psychiatric units, for community mental health services. These are the same things that we always invest in and lower amounts on those kind of innovative and new models. Um, but what we can expect to see, if you think about that huge jump in demand from you know sort of doubling of levels, this is a much bigger chunk of the community than has ever had to access mental health services before. And it is, this is just an illustration of the sorts of layered experiences everyone's been having. And these are sort of just indicative, but it's that layering of changes in work, in your type of work and your working arrangements, while you also got this risk of transmission, driving fear and anxiety, and you've got periods of isolation and disruption and school and childcare changes. It's, it's the combination of those things has made a pretty sustained period of mental health. It hasn't, it hasn't dropped away as we'd sort of hope if you in, in other kind of emergency circumstances. And the main point I wanted to make there is we're still largely offering up one-to-one -one interventions to, for mental health. So we're trying to find ways for things like the NHS and the equivalent in Australia to provide people with one-on-one -on -one support. How do you get people to access counsellors? But the the staffing and the workforce is finite. There's only so many people we can get to have one-to-one -one support and they take a long time to train. It takes three years to get a new um, fully trained counsellor at, at the basic level. So we sort of got to move away from this idea of the thing that we're trying to fund is one-to-one -one support to people and think about all those other things that we've got this emerging evidence that is kind of effective. So a lot of the pictures I've got on the right there are about um, social prescribing kind of measures, like how do you get people embedded into community activities and it can be gardening and choirs and there's pet therapy and there's digital tools and there's exercise these are all things that have evidence behind them about improving mental health and well-being but we're still tending to focus our investment on the very expensive one-to-one -one treatments that just can't be scaled to sort of meet a doubling of demand there's no way that our, our army of counsellors and mental health psychologists and psychiatrists can extend to a doubling of of the sort of population that they serve. Um, so it's, in some ways, it's a really exciting call to arms that we've got there, that we could really think much more creatively about what a mental health and wellbeing system looks like and what it what it involves. That's, so that's all I wanted to say, sort of by way of introduction. Excellent, thank you, Eleanor. Um, yeah, three really good presentations to start us thinking, you know, rich in evidence and also in policy responses and I think ending there with, with what Eleanor said about thinking more innovatively about what the policy response is is a, is a big challenge that where there has been a policy, policy response maybe it's been to do more of the same rather than to think about how things should be different so I think that's a, a good point to, to end the presentation on. Now I'm um, going to move on to uh, about 20 minutes of, of Q&A so I've already got a couple of really good questions here. Um, can I encourage you to either wave at me, stick your hand up, or else put a, a, a question into the chat. Just um, type it into the chat box um, addressed to everyone or addressed to me, if you wish. Um, I'm going to kick off with um, just get my questions up here. Um, right, a question from Kira. So thank you, Kira, for your question here. So she addresses this to Siobhan, but I might ask um, Eleanor and Karen whether they've got thoughts on this as well. So Siobhan, I'm thinking of my daughter who's 17 and she has the burden she's carrying to protect her CEV sister, so her clinically extremely vulnerable sister. So um, Kira's point is that funding has been made available for programs in schools, summer programs and so on, but those are all about people going out and meeting again and being with other people, which, and you can understand that. 
Um, but for someone who's either clinically extremely vulnerable themselves or else is shielding somebody else in their family, that actually may not be much help. Are there any examples of policy supports that have recognized that, recognized the, the difficulties for people who may not be able to go and mix or may have real concerns about that? So I'll ask that to, to Siobhan in the first place, and then I'll also ask Karen and Eleanor if they have any thoughts on that. Thanks, and that's a really, really important question, Kira. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't know where to go on this one. I think um, there, there was a conversation that, that should have happened around um, ventilation and making schools and summer programs safer and all of these activities and putting funding in there. And that actually didn't happen. Um, but I'm not an expert on whether that is sufficient or whether it would work. Not, you know, so the, a decision was made not to do that, basically. And, and that would have helped in this situation. So for, for my part, I'm meeting a group of um, CEV people, and this is one of the things I'm going to be asking. How, how can we support you? And if you have any ideas yourself, Kira, I would be delighted to hear them and, and put them across. So um, maybe we could chat after this, and maybe you're actually part of that group that I'm talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I I hear you, and I am not sure. I don't have I don't have an easy answer to this one, but maybe others who are on the call can can help us with that too. Okay, sorry, uh, I'll just apologise. Um, my name's actually Audrey, here is my daughter, um, and I wasn't able to change, I wasn't able to try to change it, but I couldn't. So I am actually meeting with you next week. Um, can you tell me why? I mean, I'm quite shocked, actually, that you've just said that a decision was taken not to do that, um, as in a conscious decision, and I'm, I'm very shocked Um can you tell me why? I I don't have the answer, but um, I can send you on the resources from well the the um, the, the material from our, our education minister where, where she had said that this didn't this didn't um, it wasn't what they were going to do. They just they basically had decided not to do that, and there were they had received evidence that led to that decision. But let, let, let's take this offline, and I'll try and get that for okay. you. So okay. Yeah. From the Department for Education on that, I wasn't part of the conversation. This is about ventilation whether it works and all of the stuff about virus transmission and and I can't comment on any of that oh, no. I, I will I will get that information for you the Audrey and thank thanks for the question oh no no I'm not asking about ventilation I'm asking about what mental health um support is available for children who are at school um with the burden of having a CV a family member that's what I'm asking you were talking about the um, mental health support that has been put into place for young children and schools and youth services. And I'm asking you, were, was there an, an acknowledgement made that um, mental health support would need to be tailored to this particular cohort of people? That that acknowledgement was made actually. So so right. sorry, I was answering the wrong <laughs> question there, and um, apologies for that. Yeah, there was an acknowledgement made that there would be a group of young people who would feel vulnerable um, because of the their risk because of their risk because they were CV. So you you know the counsellors, but but again, sourcing counsellors for the primary school counselling program was really difficult. So you know the, the services were there; they were there for this group. There was an acknowledgement of of the issues, but. But getting getting the counselling on the ground, the one to one support actually is what would have been needed there for those individual circumstances, and and that's been difficult. And um, to, to because the counsellors aren't there, our last presentation had it, to workforce plans and the mental health strategy, but we didn't have groups of counsellors sitting ready to do this work. Um, but I'm looking forward now to meet to talking about this in more detail when we have a chat, seeing if we can do more, Audrey. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Audrey, for your question. And uh, that's really good that you're able to pick that up, pick that up in, an, in another forum, actually. So um, really good. And an a very, very important point to raise, I think, today as well. So um, I'm just going to ask uh, Shima. Shima, your hand was up. Do you want to come in and ask a question? Yes, uh, this is Shima Komi. I work at the University of Strathclyde in a project with the University of Surrey. And uh, this project gives very similar just results. I'm using 1,500 thousand respondents from the OPN survey of COVID module. Uh, 
and it shows the effect of the pandemic on four main uh, the anxiety the happiness and satisfaction and worthfulness of people during the um, pandemic and just recording like oh everything you've said is just coming in my study but in particular i would like to emphasize some of the very strange results that i was really shocked not to mention how uh, how women felt during the pandemic women were negatively uh, in a very big sample as i said like 1500 thousand respondents i can see significant negative impact on women of young people of parents parents having strictly highly significant uh, negative impact but i will talk in specific about homeschooling and one of the very striking results came that age groups of homeschooling so when i tested uh, the negative impact on well-being of homeschooling it comes that for the parents for the parents the, the well-being of parents the younger groups which is key stage one feels the the strongest effect so parents well-being is very uh, challenged and compromised when they homeschool kids in a younger age Okay, while the bigger age, when I'm talking about uh, bigger than uh, seven, yes, uh, uh, I would say key stage two or higher or even higher groups, it's not showing. So parents are happy when the bigger kids can be home, their well being is not affected. But the very striking results come from the children well being themselves of the bigger group. The children well being them, themselves were, were very much affected when they belong to the higher age. So it means that the picture is not straightforward and there's a lot of um, age specific, um, I would say, age specific factors that play in the well being and what has happened and the lockdown uh, and the lockdown uh, uh, measures that has been taking place through the pandemic. One also of the striking uh, results that I have that school shot out of the seven restrictive measures that we had during the pandemic, school shot in England, Scotland, and Wales is the strongest hit to the four MCZs, the four uh, uh, indicators of well being strongest ever like it's just um so this is some of the results that i just would like to share with you it's just uh every time i come across that i can relate because i have my I have children myself so i know what we come through is uh is very bad i wouldn't take much of your time but well done the the presentations were great excellent thank you so much uh, thank you shima for that contribution if you want to put a link to any of your work in the chat then i'm sure other people could follow that up would be really you, good. i think you. that was very interesting just to think about the differential impacts yes. on different uh, you know on, on adults depending on the age of absolutely. their children and so on. absolutely i don't have the website uh, like the website is still being in process but and i can send you you in person uh, a, a lot of our big, big, huge, gigantic ESRC report, and I'm happy Brilliant. for you just to forward it for the group who are interested in this, you know, all the group. so yeah. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask in a moment, to Karen and Eleanor, if they've got any um, responses on the points that have been made so far, um, just to highlight uh, 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 one other thing in the, the chat so far. So Chris Bundy has um, emphasized the point we were talking about before, about thinking about the physical and mental well-being of those with existing health problems who've been shielding for almost two years or over two years now, and has put a link there to a BMJ article, which people might want to follow up. Um, so Karen and Eleanor, do you want to make any comments on any of the points raised so far? The, the only one point I did want to mention is the sort of um, the, the move to telehealth. So, so we, in, the, in the initial comment from Audrey, um, I do think one of the hurdles we've overcome during COVID is a lot of services that previously people said absolutely couldn't be done online. You know, I, you know, I don't take clients on the phone. I don't take clients on video um, have been overcome. And obviously I don't know that how, how that looks where you're located, Audrey, because I know it's different in different places. Um, but I do, um, having done some research about that, that shift onto telehealth, um, we did find for people who were clinically vulnerable or um, for a whole lot of other reasons, for people with small children or who live remotely without good transport, for a lot of people, that was actually a big bonus. You know, and we talk often about the sort of silver linings of COVID, which uh, we, we talk more about the bad side of COVID, but occasionally when we talk about the silver linings, one is 
that increasing access to online versions of of mental health supports that previously had just been withheld for almost practical reasons, people who felt it wasn't possible to deliver those services online. So I sort of hope that that you might have some of that access to those online services that, that can be really helpful if you just don't want to be in those public spaces, come in contact with a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Eleanor, Karen, do you want to comment on anything that's been said so far? I mean, I, yeah, disagree. These groups really do need to be prioritised. Um, just touching in there on the physical health and obviously not being separate from mental health. I mean, we did find um, as well, though it, it wasn't within um, our published research, that the people with physical health problems, um, in particular those who'd been deemed high risk um, and had a shield, um, yeah, again, consistently reported per mental health um, at, at every wave of the pandemic. Um, but I, I suppose I, I think there has been, a, as Eleanor just pointed out, and I hope that change is maintained where, I mean, things just just like what we're doing right now, um, you know, this does make um, things a lot more accessible for people who are maybe disabled or, or don't have um, the ability to, to kind of... Um, go to events or go to conferences in, in the same way. Um, so hopefully those uh, things are maintained in the long term. Um, I think as much as we need the, um, you know, to see people face to face, I think um, this could be one potential positive from the, the pandemic. Okay. Um, great, thank you, Karen. Karen, um, there's a request in the um, chat if you could share a link to your study, please. That would be great. Um, got a question here from JD. So we seem to have concentrated on depression and anxiety. What about other mental health conditions like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, etc.? Access to support from hospital teams seems to have been extremely difficult for these people who have ended up going around in circles. So um, I'll send that one to uh, Siobhan, first of all. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I take that point and we're seeing um, th those conditions worsen. Um, so people haven't have had access to services and then have presented it with, with more acuity, um, more distress. And of course, our bed occupancy rates in Northern Ireland here have been above 100% um, in the inpatient psychiatric services um, at various points in the pandemic, it, you know, it actually usually sat above 100 percent. So so that is a significant problem. Um, and we we were working to try and we they funded Department of Health funded uh, more staff going into mental health services, statutory mental health services to meet the needs of those groups of patients. Um, but our mental health strategy is fundamental to this because the conditions and, and those settings are really bad right now. There's there's uh, several hospital wards that are not fit for purpose and that are really overcrowded. So the long term thinking needs to be put in there too. And there there is evidence um, for from service use data uh, showing more acuity and that people with those conditions, their mental health has got worse. And I'm not seeing any studies where that has actually um, leveled off or um, rebalanced where you've had that recovery like you've had with other mental health symptoms and some of the studies and like Karen's study showed there as well, things you know got better as the pandemic progressed. I'm not seeing that for those groups, but I, I'm not across the data fully either. Hey Karen, do you want to come in on that one? Um, yeah, I mean, just to really reflect what Siobhan said. I mean, we, we did find obviously people with pre-existing mental health problems, um, which included obviously bipolar. I mean, it, we weren't, we didn't break it down, unfortunately, to the different um, kind of mental health problems. Um, but they did obviously fare worse during um, the every wave of the pandemic obviously than, than compared to people without um access to services especially at the start of the pandemic i mean i know um what i'm more aware of is, is um access to cam so um, obviously children's mental health services um you know after whenever they uh, started to kind of open up again and, and the lockdown started to ease there was, I think, a three or four fold increase in young people accessing 
and needing to access these services. So I imagine across the board for other mental health services, that was the case as well. Um, and, and yeah, I think there needs to be a focus on making sure that, that these groups do have um, timely access to, to um, health healthcare as well um, and to mental health care. Um, so yeah, that's great. Thank you, Karen. El Eleanor, just briefly on that question about people who had uh, pre-existing serious mental health conditions, any thoughts from your experience in Victoria? Yeah, so look, look, I think the, the data in Victoria, interestingly, because Australia's had a really very different experience in the UK, but a lot of the what's happened around mental health has actually had lots of parallels. But I do think we do tend to focus on anxiety and depression because it's so stark. You know, these are, these are such massive and population level increases where um, for those uh, at the higher acuity end, it's a it's a smaller cohort. And so it does, um, but we shouldn't diminish it. I think, I think both Siobhan and, and Karen have, have very eloquently put about it. It, it's been a serious challenge access has been a challenge um and it, we can't take our eye off that because because for that cohort it's not not expecting to see a big drop off in terms of the um the experience that they have okay thank, thanks Eleanor. i think um time for maybe just one or maybe two questions so question for matt baker so the focus here seems to be in relation to younger people but um, just talking from his experience that he would say there's there's some of those most affected are actually in the older populations. And um, these people were already isolated and the restrictions, of course, increased that. They're also likely to be technologically deprived. So from their experience of working in a memory clinic service, they've seen the impact of the restrictions in terms of cognitive decline, mood and high levels of care stress for loved ones so to support spouses when there was much less support available. So, um, just I'll go to Eleanor, actually, first of all, um, any particular uh, thoughts or insights into the impacts on older people, particularly? Oh, I'd, I'd absolutely agree. Like what a, what a neglected group. So I think it is much easier to get around the concern for the children, which is being exacerbated through the school experience, made it much more front and centre. It was getting a lot more publicity, even though I think probably the individual impact and the, of, of isolation and loneliness for the older age groups when restrictions were really narrowing the, the opportunities to visit and connect. Um, it, again, we probably don't even talk about the, the lasting impacts of that in the same way as we do. You know, we, we really worry for the young people and the children. Um, great, great point to raise. Yeah, um, Karen, do you want to say anything about older people? Yeah, no, it's an it's a really interesting one actually, um, because in our research we didn't actually find older people were as affected, but I do think our sample was skewed because we were you know surveying older people who were kind of tech savvy enough to complete eight waves of, of data collection, um, so. I think they're going to be maybe a slightly different demographic um, from, I mean, if I think I'm actually just thinking about my mum um, and, you know, she was by herself for a lot of the pandemic and, and she wouldn't have been able to complete surveys. And and I, I do think those negative impacts that, that, that you've just touched on there, Matt, um, you know, I think I can see in, in real world, you know, how these have impacted her and, and, and people of her age group. Um, so I do think there it definitely does need to be pushed because unfortunately some of the evidence doesn't necessarily from these kind of surveys doesn't necessarily highlight them. But like I say, I do wonder if those kind of samples were, were maybe a little bit um, biased in a way because obviously not everyone will maybe have the same access to the technology to uh, complete um, kind of these kinds of surveys. Um, so yeah, I think supporting older mental health services and, and, and promoting, um, you know, ways that, that older people can, you know, because I think again about my mum, like a lot of the, uh, services and a lot of the community support that she used to, to access, like clubs and things she used to go to, um, just just disappeared and they've never reappeared, um, you know, since since the pandemic has um, apparently eased a wee bit. Um, so, yeah, I think that needs to be a real a real push, a real priority. Great, thank you. I'm going to go to Siobhan for this last question. First of all, um, we're really going to head up against the cutoff time, so hopefully you'll not get interrupted and went mid-flow. But Siobhan, just a really quick answer to 
What do you think can be done to lobby for support for all of these groups who are particularly effective? And not just looking at the CBT model, CBT model that is, it seems to be, you know, used as the answer to all mental health issues, perhaps because it's it's a cheaper option. And um, thinking back to what Eleanor said as well about needing to look for more innovative ways to offer support. So um, this is JD's question again. What, what can be done to lobby for more support for these particular groups? So Siobhan, in the first place, please. And I wanted also to say about care homes, because what happened to older people in care homes was absolutely shocking and appalling and their mm -hmm. mental health was never measured. There's no data. There were no surveys. People died alone. That was horrendous and horrific. And we actually, you know, we need to focus on that now in the inquiry about how that was handled. Mm -hmm. So just to say that, because it's on my mind, all of these averages, mass goals, important groups of people who really suffered. Now, um, so what can we do to lobby support for all these groups? Well, people like me, that's kind of my job, the voice of the voiceless. Um, we, we've left the break. I know, I think you've got 50 seconds. Right. Sorry, so, yeah, give so, you the final word. So people like me, the commissioners, we need to keep shouting about this stuff um, and we need to keep engaging with people. And we need to do, do those universal interventions and make sure that we do the face to face assessments, whether it's health visitors, whether it's people in the community looking out for older people. We need to keep doing those risk assessments in community and pulling out those vulnerable groups and getting them meaningful services 